Okay, let's go. Uh, good morning. I'm Brian Bonner. I'm the chief editor of the Kiev Post, Ukraine's English language newspaper. Apologies to those who uh, were starting a bit late due to technical uh, problems, but we're going to get through it. This is an important topic. I can't think of any topic more important for a nation at war than how it spends its defense and security budget. Ukraine has record budgets, more than $10 billion a year if you count in the, the police and law enforcement. Half of that goes to the defense ministry. We know as budgets increase, so do the chances for corruption. And that's a big issue here. So thank God we have the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption com uh, Committee that is watching these issues, watching these issues of transparency, effectiveness in, in governance, and, uh, and how this nation spends its money. Uh, because it looks like the war is going to go on for, for some time. Headlines aren't good, just from the Kiev Post. Recently, Ukraine lags in transparency and defense spending. Uh, Ukrobron Prom, the big, you know, consortium, uh, Sedon uh, company, rated low in transparency, anti-corruption efforts, and on. So we have a great uh, lineup of speakers to discuss where we are. We are here for to discuss the uh, implementation of corporate governance principles in in Ukraine's defense industry. That is the main thing, and we're here at. Uh, at the Independent Defense Anti-Corruption uh, Anti Committee event. And we're starting, though, with the representative of my country, maybe the permanent charge d'affaires, Christina Quinn. Christina, are you there? Christina, are you there? I'm here, Brian. Good to see you. Uh, and even if virtually, and good to see uh, lots of folks that we work with regularly on the line, including Mr. Husiev, of course, and uh, Ms. Paniotiti. So um, yeah, I'll just I'll just uh, start with a few opening remarks. Um, as the okay, as the uh, Biden administration has confirmed, the United States remains committed to Ukraine as one of our closest partners and friends. We can, we can continue to work together across the full range of our extensive mutual interests and partner with Ukraine as it makes critical reforms. Our efforts are focused on ensuring a strong, prosperous, democratic Ukraine fully integrated into the Euro-Atlantic community. Over the past few years, Ukraine has made great strides towards this goal, and the Ukrainian people have signaled a shared commitment to democratic government, the rule of law, and Euro-Atlantic values. But a critical barrier to Ukraine's further integration with Western economies has been the influence of politics in Ukraine's defense industry. Political interference in the defense sector distorts markets, stymies innovation and competition, increases corruption risks, and creates incentives to sacrifice long-term growth and sustainability to achieve short-term political gains. Corruption is also a persistent and pervasive threat that undermines Ukraine's progress. This threat can only be countered by constant vigilance. Fortunately, the problem of political interference and corruption has a solution, and that's reform. I'd like to specifically highlight the critical role that reform of Ukraine's defense industrial complex plays in advancement towards Euro-Atlantic integration. Carefully considered reforms can increase the independence of the industry, including state-owned enterprises, improve transparency, and eliminate corruption risk. Such changes will improve the sector's ability to equip the Ukrainian armed forces and compete in global arms markets, bolster international confidence in Ukraine's reform agenda, and strengthen the climate for foreign investment. We applaud Ukraine's progress in this area to date, thanks to strong collaboration among key government stakeholders, non-government organizations such as our host, NACO, and international partners. Many of you here today have played an active role in advocating for reform of Ukraine's defense industrial complex in line with euro Atlantic principles and corporate government uh, best practices. Thanks to these efforts, Ukraine adopted a defense procurement reform law last year that modernizes its system 
increases transparency and decreases corruption risk. Government has taken initial steps to reform state-owned enterprise Ukuro-Baram-Prom, conducting a comprehensive audit, developing a reorganization plan, and updating uh, internal documents. <clears throat> In addition, the RADA has spearheaded several important pieces of draft legislation focused on reforming this sector. Successful reform requires constant effort, as I think we all know, all of those around the table. And the moment the progress stops, uh, it begins to move in reverse. Draft Law 3822, which includes the legal framework to corporatize Ukuro Brom Prom, provides an opening for Ukraine to continue advancing defense industry reform and align with international best practices. The draft, if adopted in its current form, would private, uh, provide the flexibility needed to reconfigure and rationalize Ukraine's state-owned defense industry. There are some elements, however, that do hinder good corporate governance and transparency and could undermine reform. So the United States strongly encourages key Ukrainian stakeholders to engage in a rigorous review of the draft to ensure that it adheres to OECD's guidelines on corporate governance of state-owned enterprises. One particular area of concern is the independence of supervisory boards. If supervisory boards are state dominated and lack sufficient independence and management authority, they will reduce the attractiveness of Ukraine's defense industry to Western foreign investment, which I think we all agree is a very important, um, important quality going forward. We encourage Ukraine to consider these same OECD principles when reviewing other key documents, including the National Defense Industry Strategy and the draft investment screening legislation. To continue on the Euro-Atlantic path demanded by the Ukrainian people, Ukraine must not waver in the pursuit of reform and the fight against corruption, not just in the defense sector, but in all economic sectors and across Ukrainian society. The United States remains committed to supporting Ukraine in its Euro-Atlantic uh, ambitions, and we look forward to working with you to continue advancing these vital reforms. So with that, I'll just say thank you for inviting me to join you today, and I like, look forward to hearing the rest of the uh, discussion. Thanks very much. The first thing to say is, uh, is sorry that I can't be with you there physically today. Like everyone else, I'm very much looking forward to the day when, when we can all gather in person again. Um, and then the second thing to say is I'm, I'm very happy to, to say that, that we at the United Kingdom Embassy, we very much agree with, with literally every point that Shah Jaikhin just, just, just made. And so to not repeat all of those details, I'm, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, more general and uh, I'm going to try and speak in Ukrainian too. Uh, good afternoon everyone I'm sorry for not being able to be physically with you so I'm looking forward to an opportunity to have an eye to eye meeting with all of you and primarily I'm, I'd like to say that I'm very happy to have this invitation to join this very session and uh, I was one of the first secretaries in the uh, UK Embassy and I don't have uh, uh, too many opportunities to address such, as, such a prominent audience yet uh, this is a great opportunity for me to participate in the event organized by NACO and we are very proud to have this cooperation with the NACO that we continue to cooperate with NACO as well. We highly estimate the important role of the civil society in this area and in Ukraine on the overall and I believe that Ukraine has to be proud of uh, having such an expert NGO sector I would like to reiterate certain topics that were mentioned by Ms. Quinn regarding the reasons why the why do we have such a briefing today, why it is important for UK. We are proud that this year we are chairing the uh, group of ambassadors of the great seven countries in 
Ukraine and uh, possibly you know that we made public the priorities for our group in the upcoming years and one of the priorities for the great seven countries in Ukraine that we have underlined was to reinforce the corporate governance in the defense industry in the frames of the wider reform of a defense industry complex. And speaking of the corporate governance, as was mentioned by Christina Quinn, the international standards to include the OECD standards should become a goal for Ukraine. And the other issue, why these standards are so important for Ukraine, it, the corporate governance means better management, means better leadership, means more innovations and more income. Therefore, the state enterprise could promote the further development of uh, Ukraine. Take into consideration this overall picture, I would like I'm looking forward to the speeches of other uh, speakers and experts of NECO today. And uh, in the end, I would like to say that uh, I wish a fruitful work to all the speakers and all the audience today. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oleksandr Zavetnamich. I'm the head of the Committee on National uh, Defense, Security and Intelligence. I'll be very brief as we are talking about the draft law 3822, which is a crucial draft law. We have over 1,000 amendments and currently the subcommittee and the working group are working very fruitfully though I'd like to mark the experience that we have with the previous laws in the committee regarding the defense procurements and intelligence. I'm talking about the implementation of this law, which is even more important issue. We do feel the support that is coming from our partners as they're sharing their expertise, which is a very valuable one. But ladies and gentlemen, please, we have to stay united and we have to work jointly on the implementation of this law. We have a political will of the president of the parliament uh, with regards to this enormous transformation process. I'm sure we will succeed but we have uh, to uh, stay united and to work jointly and efficiently on the implementation of this law. This is what I wanted to mention. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I do have to switch off right now and I wish all of us success. Okay, uh, as far as I understood, I'll be the next speaker. I'm uh, happy to welcome all of you and I'm grateful for the information that was sent. I'd like to underline the importance of the implementation of this draft law and we are making sure that the corporate governance reform was to be implemented in all spheres including the defense. It is crucial in order to uh, diversify the, the taking of political decisions and their implementation and the corporate governance and the management of the company. It has to be divided the management and the policy issues has to be divided. And this is what the corporate governance is about. And just yesterday, we have talked about the proprietary policy of Ukrabronprom, and this uh, ownership policy has to go in line with the OECD uh, principles, and hopefully it will be amended as follows based on the yesterday's session. I'd like to draw your conclusion, that, uh, your attention to the fact that the draft law 3822 was originally approved in the first reading. Currently, it's being amended and hopefully the principles of, covenant, uh, of corporate governance will stay as they should be 
and not by replacing the management with the direct control from the ministry. I will make sure this is not going to happen. And I'd like to uh, uh, underline the importance of uh, approving another draft law that we have submitted to the parliament. Hopefully it will be considered uh, during the uh, at the session of the National Security and Defense Committee. I was responsible together with my team for preparing this draft law and I'm grateful to the parliament for approving this draft law despite it was uh, the uh, object of many discussions. We hope that the draft law 3822 would be approved in the second readings without the harmful amendments. Uh, and I do hope that the idea of transformation would not be violated and it will go according to the plans and programs. And over the period of work of this team, there were no corruption scandals, which underlines the transparency of the activity of this team. And it supports the intentions to correspond to all the ethical standards we have uh, completed a number of important aspects like running the audit, introduction of corporate ethics principles, which is absolutely important for the anti-corruption activity. And I'm grateful to the team of experts that despite the criticism continues to work in the right direction, which produce ideological changes into the uh, national uh, defense uh, industry. I won't take too much of your time. We do need to work fruitfully. And thank you for the invitation. If you have any questions, please address them. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Stina. Good morning, all the participants. I'm happy to welcome you from Japan. I have received the second negative coronavirus test, so I have to fly to Ukraine in a couple of hours, but I have to take this opportunity and to join this event from Japan. And this event is organized by NECO. I'd like to welcome all the participants. I'd like to underline that the reform of the corporate governance for the defense industry companies is crucial for the national security. And uh, it's also crucial for our Euro-Atlantic aspirations. It's important to mention that the need for transformation of defense industry enterprises has been on the table for many decades, while in the same time, these uh, companies have accumulated significant amount of debts particularly in the end of last year we were talking about 15 billion hryvnias of debts so the corporatization of ukrabronprom and companies will allow to create an absolutely new defense holding with a different model of governance which is important for the transfer of technologies for the access to the international financial markets for creating joint projects with our international partners and these opens up uh, a lot of opportunities particularly the draft law 3822 that was already mentioned by Mr. Zavitnevich and by Ms. Panayutidi and this provides for creating joint companies uh, between the Ukrainian and foreign companies. So it creates more opportunities. And uh, this draft law was approved uh, in January as part of the first reading. So as we already heard, there are amendments to the second hearing currently in progress. I'd like to support Ms. Panayutidi and hopefully that uh, those amendments will uh, make sure that the ideas of the project shall remain the same. That is a system of corporate governance, a modern system and a new system of management for defense industrial complex. It's this draft law should become a, a sort of a deterrent factor for all the corrupt practices. And it's important to mention that we are implementing a modern a management system created in accordance to the international standards 
we've already heard the OECD standards, and this is the very important foundation for our reform. In the end of the previous year, I have signed an order that has launched the corporatization process, that is the preparation, the inventory, the creating uh, creation of commissions, and this work continues currently, and hopefully the approval of the draft lot 3822 in a second reading will create a proper foundation for a new corporate governance structure of uh, uh, Ukarabron Enterprises. And this is something that we were looking for for many years, including the uh, management of those enterprises. So we are about to launch global transformation and it's important to state that we are working as the joint team uh, of experts all in all to provide the armed forces of Ukraine with the advanced materiel and uh, we are implementing the uh, ethics code, the anti-corruption system, we're implementing the polygraph testing for the uh, leadership of the enterprises. If necessary we will do the repeated polygraph testing we conduct uh, service investigations, we cooperate with different expert organizations and we are grateful for the attention on the part of NACO to the reform of uh, Ukrobronprom and the defense industrial complex and I'd like to mention in the end that it's only together that we would be able to build a modern uh, and uh, free of corruption model of control over the Ukrobronprom with the modern governance structure. At this point, I'm grateful for this invitation and I'm happy to join you from Japan. Congratulations on your negative COVID test uh, and, and we wish you a safe flight. Well, the analytical brief was created to assess the current status, where we are at the reform process. So I'm glad to hear today that our international partners, uh, Christina Queen and James Roadmore, as well as the uh, representatives of uh, the public authorities are currently on the same page. So everyone agrees that uh, what should be the model for the corporate governance that should be a corporate governance uh, standards implemented into the defense industry. Although our report reminds everyone that it was not always the case for Ukraine and we're looking at the historical experience of Ukraine particularly uh, to, we're looking at the historical prerequisites as well as the uh, the development of this uh, system because the corporatization started in the 90s and at the same time we are trying to analyze uh, the situation for example in 2016 when uh, the law of Ukraine was passed on the governance of the state uh, property companies particularly uh, reflecting the standards of corporate governance. As we know, at that time, President Poroshenko uh, vetoed that law and mentioned that uh, implementation of corporate governance uh, structure contravenes the national security interests. And at that time, the Okorabron Prom was excluded from that reform and as we can see, this reform is a long-awaited reform. And uh, in our brief report, we have looked at the international experience as well, because uh, this issue is raised many times in public uh, spheres, like whether we can do that, whether shouldn't the state have to have a direct control over those companies and the Transparency International Security and Defense which is uh, stationed in uh, UK they're conducting regular assessment of uh, uh, integrity uh, 
of uh, defense companies and unfortunately Ukraine and Ukrabronprom are scoring low according to this defense integrity index and uh, we've also mentioned in our brief some of the companies that scored high according to the uh, integrity index for example an Italian company Leonardo which is partially owned by the state now most of the members of the supervisory board of that company are independent uh, entities. There are gender quotes uh, established for the supervisory board. So this is a state enterprise, yet it has proved its transparency in accordance to the best corporate uh, practices. We're talking about the ethics code, we're talking about the channels of communication from uh, whistleblowers uh, the policy of accepting gifts, the co policy of uh, verifying different communications and uh, it also uh, tells the work of the audit uh, agencies. So these companies are um, successfully operating. There is another company from Finland that is the uh, Patria, then Raython uh, company from the United States which is producing the javelins so they also scored high in that uh, defense integrity index so the transparency in the corporate governance in fact they support the effectiveness and the success of the company and they do not uh, run in conflict with the national security one more thing that I wanted to mention I would like to say that in this brief we mention a number of issues. We provide a timetable for laws and regulations, what was the roadmap for corporatization in the defense industry and there was not too many successes until 2019-2020. Uh, the progress significant progress we saw in 2020. We want to underline this progress. Uh, the supervisory board has been operating and the management of the concern has introduced a practice of international independent financial audit and this is something that was mentioned by NACO and that was something that we advocated highly with regards to the Ukrainian defense industrial complex and we can see that uh, they've already started the preparation for the corporatization uh, and uh, uh, Mr. Gusev also mentioned about his order with regards to the preparation. We can also see that there is a compliance office in Ukrabranprom. They have approved the ethics code that the anti-corruption program was approved and the roadmap for compliance was approved as well. So some steps are made uh, towards the increase of transparency and incorruption policy. In the same time, as of today, we cannot uh, tell that Ukrabron Prom is a completely transparent company because there is an analysis of the transparency, international security, and defense, which uh, shows that the Ukrabron Prom companies rarely publish information on the implementation of the anti-corruption programs. Moreover, the activity of these uh, enterprises is not that transparent. As of February 2021, the Ukrobron had 97 enterprises, but if we take a look at their websites, only 20 out of that 97 enterprises are publishing their annual financial report which also signifies that there is problems with the transparency. would like to mention that we can see a number of positive steps, particularly that our international partners, the ambassadors of the great seven countries, uh, they support this reform publicly and they support the uh, movement of Ukraine towards NATO and uh, support Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations 
and that helps a lot with the implementation of this reform and we as the civil society we are absolutely grateful for the support that we are receiving and special thanks goes to James Rodmore and the government of the United Kingdom for supporting the civil society including NACO for many years in this very complicated sector which has to be absolutely under uh, the civil democratic control and we are moving towards that uh, and in conclusion I'd like to mention a number of risks in future we understand that the draft law 3822 will be a crucial one as it will identify the framework for corporatization and the success of implementation of corporate governance standards and we know that even today this draft law as it is is not the ideal it's not the optimum and it's not fully uh, compliance with the standards of the OECD and we provided a table which uh, identifies any contradictions available between the draft law and the OECD principles. The owner of the state enterprise says there should be uh, there should be one agency and we believe that should be a cabinet of ministers of Ukraine although in uh, this draft law this uh, issue is not clearly identified. It could be both the cabinet of ministers as well as the uh, another ministry. Is it and it that might create certain problems with the governance. We can see that this draft law does not provides for uh, the uh, guarantees and the responsibilities for the operation of the uh, independent uh, supervisory board. And we can also see that uh, more needs to be done with regards to the transparency in the process of reorganization and the transfer of property. There could be a lot of corruption risks and we in NACO, we recommend there has to be a list of mandatory information to be published in the process of reorganization for us. Uh, the civil society as well as the journalists and the rest of the society so that we could monitor over this process and we do hope that uh, those amendments uh, under consideration of the Verkhovna Rada committee they will take into consideration uh, this issue with the cabinet of ministers to become the solely sort of proprietor and we recommend that uh, and other amendment will be approved with regards to the independent supervisory agencies and independent members of those uh, supervisory boards as well as their competences and functions. And we also suggest there has to be additional mechanisms to ensure transparency through mandatory publication of decisions of concern or the state enterprises on free of charge alienation of property and these are the major recommendations that we would like to mention as for the concern uh, speaking not in terms of the law but in terms of the activities undertaken by that could be undertaken by the concern today we suggest an annual assessment of corruption risks to be conducted. Uh, there has to be a report on the status implementation of the corruption activities, anti-corruption activities. And there has to be a system to protect the whistleblowers of any corrupt practices. We have to uh, come up with the process of a verification of counter agents we have to uh, organize the training for the personnel on compliance. All the information has to be published online and definitely these are all the standards for corporate governance and they will be implemented upon the approval of this draft law and hopefully that was mentioned by Mr. Zavitnevich. We need 
to work together and I call upon the uh, society and the international community to monitor closely on the issue of implementation upon the approval of this law. We need to monitor uh, the establishment of the supervisory board, who's going to be members of that supervisory board, how are they going to be elected. We'll need to monitor the drafting process for a new statutory document and how the best practices for corporate governance will be included into those documents. So a lot of um, work has to be done. We're only in the beginning of this process. Thanks, Elena. Uh, I want to stay in the studio. I'm going to go to Gleb Kanevsky. He's the chairman of the watchdog known as State Watch. And he's one of the experts that the people goes to watch. in assessing uh, transparency, corruption in the defense industry. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I will continue in English, uh, in Ukrainian through interpretation. And I'm grateful for the NACO for such a profound analysis that this organization has identified the key risks and aspects with regards to the implementation of the corporate governance under the draft law 3822. And at the same time, I'd like to provide a number of vivid examples where we can have problems inside of Ukraborn Prom and how do we how could we try to sort of detour uh, those risks for us not to have to meet somewhere in the year discussing the problems that we already face. And let's consider the large state enterprises that has already moved ahead with regards to the implementation of the corporate governance and yet have faced a number of challenges that are already being discussed in the society, which presents a damage to the uh, to those companies, particularly with regards to the operation of the supervisory board. Uh, this year, we had some challenges with regards to the state enterprise Ukrainian railroad, uh, and the damages of the company because of the quarantine and the COVID. The annual uh, uh, damages was around 11 billion Ukrainian hryvnia. In the same time, the society keeps uh, speaking about the effectiveness of the supervisory board and whether the supervisory board has completed the tasks in 2020 because there was a conflict between the supervisory board and the director of the U Ukrainian railroads. And uh, so far, uh, there is no question. There are no answer to the questions of uh, how effective was the supervisory board. So I believe uh, this is important, and that was mentioned in the recommendations of NACO. We need to provide at the level of legislation certain indicators for assessing the effectiveness of supervisory board. They have. They has. They, they have to be clearly identified with regards to the members of the supervisory board so that everybody could assess the effectiveness of their operation and this would be able to substantiate the necessity of independence for the supervisory board of Ukraboron Prom as currently we have some ideological debates whether this is the uh, defense industrial enterprise and therefore the supervisory board has to be representing the state officials and not the uh, individual independent, independent individuals. So there has to be a criteria to assess properly every member of the supervisory board. And it's also a question of professionalism and things like that. Though there won't be such questions then. Another important issue is the operations uh, and activity of the management of those enterprises. So what are the tasks of the management? The COVID uh, has underlined the importance of this topic, how the management of the state enterprises, how they are able to respond rapidly to any crisis, how can they change their plans uh, 
and uh, seek for additional sources for income and I'd like to uh, bring up the example of another company uh, which has made several steps with regards to the implementation of uh, uh, corporate governance. Uh, I'm sure the, this quarantine has uh, made a significant impact on the activity of Ukr Aero Ruch. And so they have a number of uh, um, damages, financial damages, because of the quarantine. And when we've tried to identify whether this company has identified a plan uh, of how to respond to this crisis, the Ministry of Infrastructure has told us that this plan, as of the end of March 2021, this plan is still in the process of uh, drafting. So we already have a year of this crisis, we already have a year of those limitations that has an impact on the activity of this state company, and they still have not come up with the plan how to uh, operate under this very situation. And here is the third example that I wanted to mention about this anti-corruption. This is a very important example. And NACO briefing mentioned that there has to be some preventers uh, for anti-corruption mentioned in the legislation. And we support this because currently when we have a large level of corruption in Ukraine, when the law enforcement agencies and the prosecutor's office and the judicial branch of power are not effective in countering the corruption within the public sector, we believe it's important to search for alternative options, how to sort of uh, enshrine those anti-corruption uh, aspects in the legislation. And if you took take a look at the company Ukra Energa Atom, last year there was a scandal about the company and the director of, of the anti-corruption department was dismissed. And according to the international practices, and he was the best compliance officer in Ukraine. He was, uh, and he was dismissed from his position because he submitted certain uh, information on certain risks. Uh, I'm on the activity of the management of Ukra Anarho Atom, and currently there is a judicial process between uh, him and the management of Ukra of Ukra Atom that is really damaging uh, the uh, image of the state enterprise. So there has to be certain guarantees of security for the compliance officers. We need to think of something. Uh, in the legislation so that the people who would be appointed to that position they should be uh, protected from being dismissed from uh, but they should really feel protected well, speaker yes. Alexander Lysenko you've been sitting quietly and patiently you get the last word it looks like yeah, to build on the discussion Thank you. Thank you, Brian. For your permission, I will continue my speech uh, in Ukrainian. Uh, okay. All the previous speakers today mentioned a lot about the implementation of OECD standards for Ukroboronprom, and I would like to uh, provide a small history. Our team of uh, independent experts has uh, was working on the uh, target model for carpet governance for Kuraboron Prom and this project was made possible uh, with the assistance of Foreign Commerce Office of UK and in the frames of this project we have analyzed the current status of the corporate governance structure of Kuraboron Prom whether it complies with the OECD principles or not and I'm sure that everyone clearly understands that the current status uh, is not in line with the OECD principles, but when the colleagues have mentioned uh, this draft law, uh, the 30, uh, draft law 38.22, as the step towards those um, principles, I uh, uh, say that we need to be very careful about this. And Olena Trugup and uh, Christina Quinn has mentioned the risks of that draft law, and uh, I'd like to 
talk more about the uh, correspondence of this initiative to the OECD corporate standards. So the first thing I'd like to mention is about the uh, governance entity and as Olana has mentioned the draft law provides for two uh, uh, management entities like cabinet of ministers and the ministry or for industry. The right answer to the uh, a question about the uh, corporate entity and the OECD clearly states that the function of management has to be divided from the function of the developers of the policy and having read the regulatory documents on the Ministry of Industry this is the central executive authority that creates the policy in the field of defense industry and that is why the question whether it can serve as the management entity for Corroboron Prom. This is a direct violation of the OECD principles. The next issue that I'd like to raise here is the supervisory board. Why do we need the supervisory board? It is a tool to prevent any political influence on the activity of Ukraboron Prom and uh, uh, this is where we come up with the need for many uh, companies to have more independent members of supervisory board. We don't have, we don't see any professional debate on why do we need to have special uh, exclusions for Ukraboron Prom. The other uh, concern raises with regards to a possible prohibition of uh, having foreign uh, um, officials or foreign citizens uh, be members of the uh, supervisory board. It's not that there is an intention to have foreigners as part of the for supervisory board. The, the idea is to have the most professional experts as part of the supervisory board. Therefore, I don't believe that uh, imposing any limitations on that aspect is not the right um, path to be taking. And should we take a look at the international experience uh, and the companies that were mentioned by Olena, uh, they don't have such limitations. In conclusion, I'd like to uh, present Another small issue, the Cabinet of Ministers has uh, provided with uh, two uh, regulations, including the Ukraboron Prom and some of the uh, state enterprises to implement the OECD principles. So the draft law 3822, in, as of now, it does not provide for the resolution of this issue for Ukraboron Prom, and therefore it has to be uh, reconsidered. Speaking of the OECD principles in further, they have the principle of unanimity and unity of legislation sort of for all the enterprises. Back in 2016, Ukar Obron Prom was excluded from the overall legislation that regulates the um, requirements to corporate governance in the state enterprises and currently there is a special law for that. Uh, this has to be a legislation which is unique for all of the enterprises and therefore a special uh, regulations or law for Ukaroboron Prom. This is something that is not in line with the OECD principles and I believe that these norms should only be provisionary as the end state should be as follows that Ukaroboron Prom just as the other state enterprises and the other companies operating in the market they have to be regulated by the unified legislation and uh, I think this concludes my speech. And Mustafa is here. Maybe we'll give Mustafa Nayem the last word. <laughs> and the question, speaking about the corruption risks as well, 
as well as uh, this question regarding the uh, property of the state enterprises. As for the draft law on the corporatization, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a not a know-how and we have some uh, uh, classified regulations of the government starting from 2016 and uh, the government has already provided instructions on the beginning of the corporatization and uh, this process was launched in accordance to all the regulatory documents. The only lacking was the draft law to officially launch this process. I know there are a lot of people that uh, are, are not happy with the draft law, believing that this reform should go in line with the present uh, legislation. And I would divide them into two groups of people. Some of them are truly interested in our enterprises uh, and are trying to monitor the situation with the contracts and of course they are not interested in having Ukrabronprom or any other enterprise to become corporates as that would uh, make them free from any political influence. Then the other group of people are simply those people who don't understand the reality in Ukrabronprom. Let me explain what will happen if for example, somebody would start the corporatization or the reformation of Ukrabronprom uh, without the draft law. And these are the uh, verified facts that I'm going to underline it today. So please take them into consideration. First of all, from the beginning of the corporatization of any state enterprise that is turning that into the a limited liability company or joint stock company, all the creditors uh, can uh, go to the court uh, and ask for return of their debts. Currently, uh, Ukrobron from debts amount to 12 billion Ukrainian hryvnias, and our enterprise will have to return those debts. We don't. We are not saying that we are against the return of those debts. It's just that we're doing a lot of things without the laws. That is the optimization of the assets and thing and other aspects. But when people will start going to the courts, we'll have a lot of enterprises going bankrupt because only some of the enterprises can repay their small debts, while most of the enterprises will not survive any court hearing. And this is the major reason why we're not able to move forward with the corporatization. The second reason is that in addition to state enterprises, there are certain uh, tr sort of private or, or public enterprises that cannot be turned into an economic enterprises. Uh, and the draft law 3822 explains how this process could be uh, implemented. In accordance to the current legislation of Ukraine, in order to start the corporatization or any transformation of state enterprise into the economic enterprises, you have to assess all the property available so that this property could be transferred properly. And that means that uh, the enterprises will have to spend millions of grimness to launch the assessment of uh, the assets. And we have some of the enterprises that do not have that amount of money. While well, this draft law provides for a possibility of transferring these assets, and the draft law provides for the, for the assessment only in case of the alienation of property. The second issue, which is very important, that is blocking the operation of enterprises because of the problems with the primitive documents or certificates. There is a license of uh, foreign economic entities, uh, the li license of foreign expert activity and things uh, and other documents. We all of them will be invalid if we'll launch the corporatization or renaming of the enterprises without the draft law. 
and they would not be able to be transformed automatically and this will take time so imagine if the export company which is supplying weapons to the foreign market will lose its license in the process of negotiations or uh, as part of the tendering procedure or we have certain company in the register will lose uh, its license and will lose its right to uh, participate in the implementation of the state defense order while uh, supplying the weapons to the armed forces and this would result in the delays from 6 to 12 months and will be not will not be able to fulfill our commitments because of legal reasons speaking of the anti-corruption I'd like to underline that uh, in the frames of the concern we are conducting a lot of activities without resolving this conflict will not be able to properly transfer those enterprises into the holdings why uh, shouldn't we do that because I wouldn't like that in the state defense sector we would have more corporate conflicts as they may result in the alienation of uh, assets this is why we are trying to solve all the corporate conflicts at this stage I'm sure you already know about this as they may result uh, in more publicity the major issue is that without the draft law of 3822 we will have the same problems that we have faced in the 90s we don't know who is buying the debts of Ukarobronprom at the secondary market. Now those uh, debts are being concentrated uh, within a certain entity. So the beginning of the corporatization would result in uh, numerous uh, companies becoming bankrupt. Speaking about the corporate governance system, why is it important uh, from the point of transparency and corruption practice practices? I'm sure all of you evidenced the situation in defense industry complex over the past 15 years uh, and uh, everyone knows what was happening starting from 2006. The major aspect for or the major reason for corrupt practices was political influence when the directors of the company uh, were approved by the political decisions when the, the uh, uh, general managers uh, of Ukarabran Prom were appointed by the presidents for example when the uh, uh, management over the security and defense sector is done manually without any policy and strategies in this case uh, any change in power n at the level of ministries central executive authorities and our companies will automatically result in uh, the need to change the strategy of development and then there is a conflict of interest and then there are uh, corrupt practices and then we have uh, uh, scandals uh, affecting our capability to produce weapons the corporate governance will allow to cut any political influence which is the major source of corruption in Ukraine uh, and uh, it's absolutely important for us in conclusion, I'd like to tell you that we have mentioned a lot that defense industrial complex of Ukraine is not effective if uh, staying under public ownership and that there are successes in other countries including the situation with Elon Musk and we have conducted an analysis what would happen if Elon Musk would be appointed to the uh, as the head of Ukraboron Prom or its enterprises and would start to do oh, the same uh, as he's doing in the United States now in my understanding something like in three months uh, he would have he would be subject to criminal uh, proceedings because the current legislation uh, prevents an effective operation of the state uh, enterprises 
besides, we are limited in terms of our uh, agreements. All the agreements and all the payments under these agreements have to be coordinated in different state agencies. Then when we are buying something or we are selling something, we have to coordinate that with public authorities. And then there are artificial limitations on the cost effectiveness as well as on the ability of state enterprises to use their assets and funds. While the private enterprises, they don't have such limitations because the private uh, company may go to foreign market with zero level of profitability in order to start its production or and then to accumulate its profits because of the procurement or because of the sale of its products. And the public companies are not able to do so. So uh, currently the uh, defense industrial sector is limited in terms of its capabilities uh, while the other companies are being developing and we are grateful and we are happy with the private sector but we should remember we should focus on our, the public companies as well so this draft law is more of a survival so to say it's not a mild reform this is the uh, law that will change significantly the procedures and will allow us to be more competitive, will allow to produce uh, uh, the products effectively. We have over 50% of our facilities and uh, real estate uh, assets are not being registered, so we don't have documents on that. So the coefficient of return of assets is only 3.5%. So we're, we're not talking about the effectiveness, absolutely, because the security of those facilities and their retention is a part of uh, uh, the uh, original cost of the products. And the draft law will allow to avoid any political influence. Thank you. Mustafa Nayem, he's deputy head for asset management of Girl Rome Prom. Of course, he came to fame as an investigative journalist, instigator of the Euromaidan revolution, and a member of parliament. Great overview. We are so out of time. Uh, Elena, is this going to be on online anywhere for people to, to watch on, on your website? In the future. Так, звісно, ми викладемо онлайн двома мовами дану. Yes, we'll provide this uh, presentation in two languages online. And thank you, Brian, uh, uh, as you're the representing you're representing the best and the most independent newspaper in uh, Ukraine. Uh, so we're very grateful for the organizers and sorry for some technical issues that we had. Hopefully, if uh, you missed somewhere, uh, something in the course of uh, uh, this presentation online, hopefully you'll be able to watch that later on. Thank you to all the speakers and the guests. Issue, but we've got a lot of good people working on it, so hopefully we'll be making progress. Thank you and goodbye.